Hey, y'all. Welcome to the 2021 Vectric Worldwide User Group Meeting. My name is Mark Lindsay from Mark Lindsay CNC. And for, before I get into today's presentation, I'd like to first do a little bit of housekeeping and thank Becky, Edward, Todd, Stephanie, Ollie, Adam, David, everybody in the entire Vectric crew for number one, putting on this worldwide user group meeting. Number two, for inviting me to be a part of it. This is truly an honor for me and thank you to the entire Vectric crew. Today, I'm going to get into a little bit of double-sided machining. And as you can see, I'm in a rather bare shop. I have spent the last year building a new CNC workshop in my backyard, and I've got absolutely nothing in here. So I apologize for any echo you may hear <laughs> in my audio. I'm still getting set up here. When Becky reached out to me and asked me to do something about double-sided machining, I thought, well, what better thing to add to a brand new shop than a shop clock? So that's what I'm going to be presenting today. And I'm also going to be talking about some major considerations that maybe you haven't thought of when it comes to making clocks in general but definitely on a two-sided shop clock. The first piece of advice that I would give you would be to make sure you have the clock movement in hand because there are going to be some measurements you'll need to take directly from this clock movement to apply to your design. It's okay to come up with a clock face or a clock dial design, before you have that movement. But there are going to be things like the shaft diameter that you're going to need to take directly from the movement. You're also going to need the shaft length. Now, on a clock movement, don't think that just because this shaft has a total length of three quarters of an inch or 20 millimeters, that you can put this in a 20 millimeter or three quarter of an inch piece of material because that's not the case. There's a lot of hardware that goes on this shaft as well. If you not only have the hands, but you have washers and nuts that are going to fasten this to the clock material itself. So that would be my first piece of free advice. Have the movement in hand. Now, Included in the files that you'll receive from Vectric if you do purchase the files is a README file that shows the source of this movement. This is a Seiko high torque movement. That's another thing to consider. If you're going to be using hands that are five inches long or longer, like these that I have selected, you will need a high torque motor because the lower torque motors just don't have the power to move those hands and keep proper time. So a few things to consider before you start your design. Now, when you do start your design in Aspire, and my transitions are not as smooth as some that you have seen, believe me. <laughs> so let me get into Aspire here. When you do start your drawing, you will go into your job setup. And one of the most important things to make sure that you check is that this is a double sided project. Now I've got my material width, my material height, my material thickness in inches because that's the units of measure I use. The other real important setting is the flip direction between sides. This is something that you will need to use on a constant basis. The direction that you flip your material in is going to decide 
the location of your locating dowels. So it's that is of the utmost importance. For Z0 position, I tend to set mine to the material surface no matter which side I am working on. So I'll have a Z0 position on the material surface on the top and on the bottom. I do not zero off the same side. This is a choice. Your mileage may vary. And we are not doing any 3D modeling in this presentation. Um, so I can take that back down to standard and click OK. Then we're all right. Now, as you can see, I came up with three separate drawings here by taking advantage of one of the new features in version 11 of the uh, Vectric software. And that is I'm using multiple sheets. When I decided to go for a shop clock project, I thought, well, there are three really popular types of shops. One being a wood shop, so I went for the saw blade design. One being a mechanics shop, so I went for a disc brake rotor. And the other being a machine shop, so I decided to use a gear. And you can see how I'm switching back and forth between the sheets by triple clicking on the sheet that I want to proceed to. So I'm gonna go back to the wood shop sign that uses the saw blade. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on uh, bitmap tracing or how I got the artwork uh, for each of these shapes. They are included in the files that you will receive from Vectric should you decide to purchase them. One of the first things that I will do when I'm setting up a two-sided machining project is I will select one clock face that I'm going to work with, and I want to get the position of my locating dowel holes. Now, these locating dowel holes have been the cause of some major controversy. I can't tell you how many times I've had discussions with folks who watch a video presentation or see how I do my locating dowels and then tell me they will never work. They will work exactly the way I'm going to describe if you follow a few certain rules. So using a new session of Aspire, I will take my piece of work material here and I know I'm going to be cutting a round clock face. So I'll go into draw a circle and I know the diameter of the clock I want to cut will be 12 inches. So I'm going to center that circle on my X0, Y0, which is set to my material center for layout purposes. And I'm going to enter a diameter of 12 inches, create that circle. This gives me a reference on the top of the material that we are looking at the top here. I now know where my profile cutout is going to be made, even though that profile cutout is going to be cut out on the bottom. I will cut the top first, then the bottom. So I know I'm safe to put locating dowel holes out in this area here and down in here. I'll then change to a one quarter inch diameter. And I'm going to come up into this area over here somewhere. It doesn't really matter where and just click, then come down here and click as well. So now I have my two locating dowels. These on the top of the material will be carved into the material surface. So what I'll do is I'll select both of these by holding down shift. Then I'm going to immediately right click and I want to put a copy of these down holes, dowel holes on the other side. So I'll select copy to other side. Then now if I come up here and I toggle my view and look at the bottom, 
And we can tell we're looking at the bottom because the guide rulers have changed orange. I now have corresponding holes on the back. This is where people tell me that it's never going to work because on the top, this locating dowel is at the top left and on the bottom, it's now on the top right. You need to remember if you hold the palm of your hand in front of your face and look at where your thumb is with your palm facing away from you, your thumb is facing one direction, then rotate your palm so that your palm is facing towards you. Your thumb is facing the other direction. It's the same with this piece of material when you flip it from side to side. So it is definitely going to line up. The fact that I did not make these symmetrical also makes it foolproof in that you simply can't mount this wrong. If you drill the dowel holes in the surface of your material, then these dowel holes will be drilled into a sacrificial spoil board. You cannot get this wrong. It will only go one way. Then I will use screws here, 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 and here to mount this to that auxiliary spoil board. This is the most important part of a double-sided machining project is these locating dowels. The other crucial aspect of this is when you get outside on the CNC router, you will mount your material to your sacrificial spoil board, set your X and Y zero to wherever you wish, whether it be the center, bottom left, bottom right, wherever. Once you have set that X and Y zero, it will not change. It will not change again. Front side, back side, top side, bottom side, whichever you prefer to call it. You set that X, Y, zero one time and one time only. You will reset your Z, zero every time you do a tool change. But that X, Y, zero gets set once before you run your first tool path, and that's it. So let's go back over to our shop clock here, and we're going to get into tool pathing. One of the beautiful things about version 11 and using these multiple sheets is if you take this, for example, my saw blade shop clock, which is very simple, just a few vectors of the outside profile, some text. I didn't put any minute or hour indication marks. It's an analog clock. I have an analog brain. You are free to add those if you would like. But if we look at the bottom side, we see I have the outline here. This is the relief I'm going to carve for my clock movement. I've taken the physical dimensions from this clock movement and used them to base this upon. I added approximately one sixteenth of an inch, half of a millimeter, maybe a millimeter, if you're using metric, to the outside dimensions of this movement. And that's to allow the movement to slip in without it being a tight fit. This doesn't have to be a press fit into the material. So I can create this vector which shows where the clock is going to be placed. I can also create this vector up here to create a key keyhole slot using my keyhole bit. And that is simply a very tiny rectangle. I'll select it and go into select object size so you can see. The width in X is two inches long but it's only 10 one thousandths of an inch tall. I created that rectangle, then went into node edit mode and deleted the span on one end. 
that gives my keyhole bit a very tight track to follow so that it will plunge into the material here, go to the end of the rectangle, move over a very fractional amount and come back, then retract from this end as well. With these vectors in place, I then went on to my outside profile. This is where the outside profile of the clock is going to be cut out. I also included the profile of the saw blade, just in case I wanted to cut out the saw blade shape. I can use either one. And that it allows it to be customizable to you. One of the beautiful things about version 11 is once I got these first vectors set up in my design, I was able to select all of them, holding down shift and selecting them all, then right click and copy to all of my other sheets. So I didn't have to spend time on all these other sheets redrawing the same vectors. These will stay constant. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Go over here to the Sheets tab, and you can see the three sheets that I have. The bottom side is identical, with the exception of the profile of the clock. There's the brake rotor. Double-click it to make it active. And then there is the gear. I did not copy this profile. I guess I could to put on the back in case I wanted to cut out the gear shape. So the beauty of using sheets is once you have all your layout taken care of on any kind of vectors that are going to be common to all of the sheets, you, it's a simple matter to copy them all to all of the sheets if you wish. You go back over here into the drawing tab and we will switch back over to the saw blade and I will go back to the top. All right, and then we'll get into tool pathing. Now I have already created the tool paths for this project and they are included in the files if you choose to purchase them from Vectric. Before I go any further, let me say this. As you've heard many, many times before, the tool paths the bits, the feeds, the speeds are all set up for my machine and my way of machining. If you download these files and use them, go through these tool paths and make sure they are safe and appropriate for your machine. Use your own feeds and speeds. Do not rely on mine. My machine is not the same as yours. Okay, we will go through here and take a look. I'm going to not really spend a lot of time on creating and calculating the tool paths themselves, with one exception. And that is I decided to do something a little bit different for these uh, clocks in that I didn't want to cut out the individual shape of a saw blade or a brake rotor or a gear, but I did want it to have some relief to it. I wanted it to look like a saw blade had been mounted on a plaque. So what I did in that case, let me open up the preview window here, and I have changed my material color, etc. And another feature of version 11 is when you look down in this area here, right next to the tool paths, it shows here that I am working with the saw blade. Now I can change to all sheets, the brake rotor, the gear, or the saw blade. Right now I'm working with the saw blade. The saw blade is active. If I switch over to all sheets, I can look down here and I can see all of the tool paths, but you'll notice they're grayed out. I know this is the bottom corner here, 
my laptop won't let me expand this much bigger. You'll see that all of the tool paths for the other sheets are grayed out. That's because they're not active. The only tool paths that I can preview from here are in the active sheet, which is currently my saw blade. So I'll go back to the saw blade and there we are. When I tool path, I like to arrange them in the order of operations that I am going to be carving in. So my first, always, my first tool path I will run is the dowel holes in the top of the material. And that's what I've named that tool path. This is going to drill a hole here and over here about a half of an inch deep into the material. And I'll go ahead and I'll preview that tool path then so you can see it. That's going to drill that quarter inch diameter hole into the material so I can mount my dowels when I go to locate them. For this dowel hole, I use a one quarter inch upcut bit. So, you do not want to drill holes with a downcut bit. Believe me when I say this. Do not use a downcut bit to drill holes straight down. My next tool path is a blade setter pocket. What I decided to do was, if you look at a saw blade, the teeth stand proud. If you lay it flat and look at it from the side, the teeth stand proud. And the rim of the saw blade will also stand proud slightly. So I went for a very shallow pocket here. Let me go back into the tool path so you can see. I only went about a 32nd of an inch deep. This is not a deep pocket. And I just used my quarter inch end mill. So we'll close that. And then I'll preview this tool path. And we have it there. Okay. That left an area out here to where the hands of the clock and the center spoke of the clock are going to protrude out just slightly. I then drilled my through hole for the clock movement. And again, I took that measurement for the through hole directly from the shaft diameter of the movement when I had it in hand. Then I added a little bit because in this case, if it's five sixteenths of an inch in diameter, you cannot put a five sixteenths inch shaft into a five sixteenths inch hole. It would That's a press fit. It won't go. So I had to add a little bit of a diameter to that through hole. Then that's just a simple drilling tool path. And there's our through hole for the shaft. Progressing on through, I went ahead and V carved some text. That's rather self-explanatory. Then I decided to do something a little bit different. Again, to get a little bit of relief to this design to make it look like the blade was actually mounted on a plaque. Over here in the 2D view, I went with a pocket tool path, selecting my blade outline and a vector I created a little bit larger than the outside diameter of my clock. So it'll clear away this area out here, leaving this saw blade standing proud. So we'll... Go back over to the 3D view. I will come down. Come on. There we go. It needs to wake up just slightly. This poor old laptop. And we have the blade profile pocket clearance pass, which uses a quarter inch end mill, I believe. Yes, it's been a while since I created this. And we'll carve some relief around there. Then I'll come back with a eighth inch end mill 
and we'll finish up the little details, clear away everything else. Then as we rock it back and kind of look at this project, we can see it looks like a blade has been mounted to a plaque. And that's what I was looking for. So we look good there. Let me go back to a straight Z view. Then I want to switch over to the bottom. Now, the bottom tool pathing is very simple. Looking at the back here, again, there's my keyhole slot. There is my pocket. Another dimension that needs to be looked at when you are talking about creating a recessed clock movement is we'll need to go over here into the web page for the movement that I purchased. Now it says here it has a 5 16 inch shaft diameter. We'll cruise down here a little bit and we'll see their layout for the minute hand, the hour hand shaft, the minute hand shaft. But if we look over here at additional info, we can see here that it has a maximum dial thickness of 3 16 of an inch. And that's what I was referring to earlier when I talk about the threaded shaft on this movement. This shaft may be 3 quarters of an inch long, but by the time you get all the rest of the hardware attached to this shaft, your maximum face thickness is 3 16 of an inch. And somebody in the chat can help me out with what that is in millimeters. So we go back over here to Aspire. What I had to do for this pocket tool path is pocket for clock movement. Let me double click that. And we'll see I had a start depth of zero. And we see I have a cut depth here. This cut depth was calculated by taking my Z depth minus that 3 16 of an inch. And that's exactly what I entered up here. If I put Z minus 3 slash 1 6 equals 0.6875. What that means is it's going to cut down into this material and leave 3 16 of an inch, that maximum dial face of material left. And I did this with a quarter inch end mill. The corners don't have to be square. Then calculated that tool path, and we are ready to preview it. I'm not going to preview that just yet because I kind of got ahead of myself. That is how you figure out the pocket depth on that, on that clock movement. Okay, let me go ahead and turn that off. I kind of got ahead of myself. After flipping the material, or excuse me, after cutting side one of my project, the absolute first thing I want to cut will be my locating dowels in the spoil board. I'll take the material off of the table, put in my upcut bit, and I will cut these two dowel holes in the spoil board. And we'll see, that's what I named that tool path. Dowel holes in spoil board. So I'll go ahead and preview this, but no, it's not cut into the material. And we'll take a look at it in the 3D view. And there are my locating dowel holes. Now, I've got a short video that I'm going to play here and I will comment on to show you exactly what I mean. This was on a project I did a few months ago. 
and it's already on my channel, but this will demonstrate exactly what I'm talking about when I say this will work. So I mounted a sacrificial plywood spoil board to my CNC table, then mounted my material to the CNC table, then cut that first side, the top side. There are the locating dowel holes being cut into the top of the material. After carving the first side, removed my material from the sacrificial spoil board. Set my Z0 to the top of the spoil board, that sacrificial spoil board. Not to my material. Then I drilled those dowel holes into that sacrificial spoil board. Now here's where the magic happens. I'm putting the dowels into those dowel holes in the spoil board, flip the material side to side. Then using these old eyes, it took me a couple of minutes, but this video is in real time to show you that I did not edit anything. Locate the first dowel hole with these old eyes. Come on, Mark, you can do it. And it dropped right down. Then I could mount those mounting screws and carry on with the project. If you remember to use side to side or top to bottom, it's your choice in the software. You have to use that same method outside on the machine or no, it will not work. But if you remember, set your X, Y, one time, one time only, when you cut the first side of your material, it will flip over just fine. So with that being said, I then drilled my dowel hole here in the design program. We've already previewed that. I then cut, let me zoom in a little bit, cut my keyhole slot. The way the software displays tools that create an undercut, it looks like I just use a end mill. Trust me, a keyhole slot is there. <laughs> then I created my pocket for the clock movement. Then did my profile cutout using tabs to hold the material in place. And there is the finished project. Again, this is not, it's not rocket surgery as my uh, granddaughter would say. This is something that you can do very easily and just have fun with it. Um, it's one of those cases of paying attention to detail and be true to yourself, be true to your design ideas. But double-sided machining, I'm here to tell you, and this is a friendly word of warning, it is addictive. Once you get it dialed in and figured out, you will want to do more and more and more two-sided machining projects. And I'm here to tell you the, the sky is the limit. Let me go ahead and go back into my 2D view here. And we'll take a look at the brake rotor. The brake rotor was very simple. I'm going to go back to the top. The brake rotor is probably the simplest of the patterns that I made. I basically did a lot of V carving, but I did do some pocketing as well. And if you look over here, I have selected my brake rotor in my 2D view, go into the 3D view, go back to a Z view, and we're on the top. 
when I selected my brake rotor in the toolpath tab, it automatically switched over to the brake rotor. So now all of these toolpaths that I have visible here are for this brake rotor. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing how I did certain things. I will go ahead and just go through these toolpaths and talk about particular elements as I get to them. Because there are a few little design features that you can use and play around with. So I've got my do locating dowel holes here for my material. I'll now cut the through holes, which are actually would be the lug nut holes, as well as the shaft hole for the clock movement. Then all brake rotors have uh, the center hub of the rotor. It's empty because that's got to clear the bearings and everything, but I didn't want to drill all the way through. I have, still have to mount a clock movement, so I just kind of made a pocket there. So we'll go ahead and we'll preview that. This is the brake rotor itself. The center hub of the brake rotor is going to stand proud of that rotor. So what I did was I went ahead and created a pocket that is about a quarter of an inch deep that left a little bit of relief. So the center hub of this brake rotor stands proud of the rotor itself. Now also, they're not perfectly flat like this. There's a bevel here, a chamfer, and another one on the outside here. So using my 90 degree V-bit, I went ahead and I added that. Added a chamfer to the outside edge. Then I made that center hole bevel as well. Then I beveled each one of these lug nut holes because they're beveled as well on a real brake rotor. I keep going down the line here, and now we have V-carving the cooling slots on our brake rotor. And you can do this. You can either V-carve or you can carve through. I didn't want them carved through. I just wanted them V-carved, and I would paint them black or do an epoxy inlay, whichever. But now you can see we have a little bit of relief. It doesn't look like... It, it doesn't look like it's a flat projection that was just V-carved. You have some relief in there. So it looks more like a real brake rotor. A little bit of creative painting. And uh, it could, this could be very cool. We'll switch over to a straight Z view. I'll go over to the bottom. And again, these are all the same tool paths that were in the saw blade project they are all the same thing so i'm just going to go ahead and preview all tool paths we have the mounting holes we have the keyhole slot we have the relief for the clock movement then we have the profile cutout so when i flip it back over to the top after cutting these tabs loose we have a brake rotor for the mechanic in your life I, did, again, did not put any numbers or hour or minute dots out here. You're free to do that on your own. I thought it would distract from the design, so I didn't do them. So I'll go ahead and back to a straight Z view, go back to the top. And the very last file we have here is our gear. So I'll switch over to this, make this the active layer or the active sheet rather. And much like with the saw blade and the brake rotor, I didn't want to just V carve this in. So again, we'll preview the locating dowel holes in my 3D view. There they are. Go to a straight Z view there. The clock face, clock movement rather through hole. Now, I chose to V-carve the center detail rather than use a pocket and then come back with a chamfer bit 
because I wanted that depth to be the same as the V carving. So we'll go ahead and I'll preview that clearance. The more sharp-eyed among you will notice that there are 12 spaces here in between the spokes. So each one of these spaces can be used for hour or minute registration, location. Then come back to my center detail with the V-bit, which cleaned everything up and beveled those edges out here on the edge of these blank areas. Then I V carved the spoke holes here with the 90 degree V bit again. And oops, I forgot to do my clearance pass. There's my clearance pass for those that brought everything down to the same level. Then I did the spoke holes with that. Now I have the outside profile clearance. Again, I wanted this to look like a gear mounted on a plaque. So we'll preview that. Then we'll come along with the V-carve outside profile. Again, I wanted that beveled appearance because gears have beveled teeth. And there we have our gear face. You'll notice that the center portion where the movement is going to come through the clock remains flat, the material surface, the original material surface, the same as these gear center holes and the teeth of the gear. Again, there's a slight bevel on these gear teeth because of that 90 degree B bit, because that's how gears are created. So you can use your own creativity to get as, as intricate as you'd like or as plain as you'd like. You certainly don't have to carve these this way. So we'll go over to the bottom. And again, the bottom, they are the exact same tool paths as the other two clocks. And so we'll go ahead and preview all of the tool paths. And again, I use tabs on my profile cutout to keep everything in place. We flip it over and there is our gear clock face. Again, leaving that 3 16 of an inch dial depth to be able to mount my clock movement and keep everything straight. The whole basis of double-sided machining is there's a few things that you need to consider when you're double-sided machining. And that is that you may do something on one side of the project that's going to affect the other side. I'll give you an example of this. I cut into the surface of the material here about a sixteenth of an inch deep. So that would be what? Maybe a half of a millimeter, I think. I'm not quite sure. That's not very deep at all. But by removing a sixteenth of an inch of material, that could affect my keyhole slot back here. That's why I only went a sixteenth of an inch deep. If I made that a quarter of an inch, my keyhole slot may cut into the front of my project. So again, it's paying attention to detail and knowing the tools. I know how deep my keyhole bit can cut. So subtracting that depth from the thickness of my material, I was able to cut this keyhole slot and not have to worry about it cutting through the front of the design. So Again, once you get this process dialed in, it becomes amazingly addictive. And uh, I don't know, I look for excuses to do two-sided machining. So I'm going to stop screen sharing and come back over here to you all and basically ask you if you have any questions 
I, I have been trying to watch the uh, chat, but it, it's hard to do on two different devices at a time. Um, now, the keyhole slot, again, um, you kind of have to trick the software into accepting the keyhole bit. You can't just enter a keyhole bit because it creates an undercut. And the way the software displays material, it won't display the keyhole bit. So I just entered it as an end mill, but in the notes and the title, it's all noted that this is a keyhole bit only. Now, the clock movement itself comes with a hanger. So you don't have to put a keyhole on the back of the clock if you don't want to. Now, on the movement, I was asked, why did I buy such an expensive movement? That's personal preference. I'm of the opinion that garbage in, garbage out. Yes, there are cheaper movements out there, but this has my name on it. So why would I send out something that I'm charging a customer or client for that I wouldn't have in my own house? So yeah, it's, it's worth it, you know. Uh, let's see here. When we were talking about the through hole for the shaft, and I said, just make it a little bit larger. I'm talking about in Imperial, a, a few hundredths of an inch larger. I mean, if this is two and a half inches, I went for two and nine sixteenths. So a sixteenth of an inch larger makes it a 32nd a of an inch bigger on each side. So just enough to where you can slip this movement into the pocket and it doesn't rattle around. It doesn't touch. You don't have to try to force it in. And again, remember that just because this thing is as long as it is, doesn't mean you have all of that for that face. I mean, if you're using the hanger, you have the hanger to mount, get that in position, press it into place. Then you have this giant rubber washer that seals it to the back of the clock. Then you have a brass washer. Then you have a brass screw or nut rather. Then you have the hands. Then you have the finishing nut. If you have a sweep second hand, you have a sweep second. All of these things adds up. So just because it says there's a three quarter inch long shaft there doesn't mean you can use a three quarter inch clock face dial face. So, okay. Um, I think I have covered everything or I hope I have covered everything, but if, if I could enforce one thing, when you're going to be working with clocks, it is, get the movement first before you create the first tool path and then just pay attention to detail as you're creating your design now i know i didn't go into a lot of detail as far as designing is concerned because what i've talked about counts for double-sided machining clock making whatever you would want to do with it I would just say practice. Nothing will ever replace experience. And the only way to get that experience is to do it. You can do this. This is a lot of fun. And as I said, it's very addictive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. And I'll be in the chat to answer any questions that anybody may have. And um, if not, um, I'll head over into the chat room here on the UGM homepage. And if you have any questions, post them over there. Uh, and I'll try to get to them as quick as I can. But in, uh, let me see, I see one question here. Hold on, let me get back. Um, I have the same question. Let me get back and find this. And then I'll go ahead and um, go ahead and, well, all right. No, I can't find the question. But anyway, um, the main thing to remember with them is pay attention to detail. 
put your locating dowel holes into your into your material first you set your x y coordinates one time one time only before you run that first locating dowel tool path once you set those x y coordinates they do not change unless of course you have a power failure or you turn your machine off or you something like that then you may be in trouble personally I try to plan a two-sided project for when I have the time to complete the project. And these files don't take very long to run at all. So set the X, Y, zero one time. Cut the top, remove the material out of the way, slide the gantry back out of the way. Load the G code for the, the dowel holes in the spoil board. Bring your gantry back somewhere close. You do not reset the XY. Turn on your spindle, your router, whichever you had. Hit cycle start and let it drill those holes. The XY does not change. Put your dowels in. Mount it. Put your next bit in. Set your Z0 to the top of the material. The XY does not change. And run the bottom portion. It works, believe me. I've done many a bit of many a project this way. So uh, the keyhole bit, yes, it's a standard profile tool path cutting on the vector. If you purchase the files from Vectric, you can go down through those tool paths and you can see exactly what I did. Just for constraints of time, I did not have a chance to go through each one of them, show you cutting depths, et cetera, et cetera. And your project is probably going to vary. The material I have is seven eighths of an inch thick. You may or may not have anything like that. So you'll have to go back in and again, make sure that the project is safe and appropriate for your machine, your tools, your materials, everything. So let's go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, next, we have the gang from Avid CNC doing something I've been looking for forward to i would love to see you guys later on over in the chat room here on the ugm homepage. enjoy the rest of the vectric users group meeting and to everybody at vectric i wanted to give a heartfelt thanks for inviting me to do this presentation and see you on the internet folks thank you very much